To the Point with your host, News Channel 5's Kelly Dunn. Good morning and welcome. Last week, West Palm Beach elected a new mayor. Jerry Moyo will officially take over for outgoing Mayor Lois Frankel at the end of the month. Moyo won by a 51.2% vote over the other three candidates, which quickly ended talk of a runoff. And joining me now is Mayor-elect Jerry Moyo. Welcome and congratulations. Thank you. Let's get to the point. You take office in uh, the not too distant future and you're going to face some pretty daunting challenges. There's no honeymoon period <laughs> <laughs> at all. Um, I mean, we're talking about a projected eight to $10 million budget deficit for starters, uh, layoffs, buyouts. Uh, you know, first of all, why'd you want the job? <laughs> Do you want Seriously. me to answer? <laughs> I mean, you know, it's a, this is not so, I mean, you walk in and obviously I, you, I'm sure you're going to say you feel like you can make a difference, right, but how do you hit the ground and start tackling these enormous issues? Well, they are enormous and uh, it is because I feel like I can make a difference. I, you don't do this, you know, put mm -hmm. yourself out in this way unless you really feel you can make a difference. Um, we do have large challenges. Um, budget is going to be our biggest one. Mm -hmm. As you said, we probably will have a t $10 million deficit. We're going to have to make some hard decisions. Well, and already there's talk and, and city employees are being offered a buyout plan. Talk to us about that buyout plan. Yes. Um, last year we did this. We had a buyout plan and it was really quite successful. About 55 people took advantage of it. Um, many to start new careers or to go into retirement a little early or just to try something different. So I think a lot of people saw it as a good opportunity to maybe take a risk because they had a little cushion. Um, hopefully we'll get some people this year as well who will be interested in, in taking the buyout. Uh, we're aiming it more at people who've been here longer, have been working in the city longer, um, so that uh, they could consider maybe trying something new or, um, you know, take mm -hmm. advantage of the buyout. But from what I heard, I mean, it, it's not that big of a cushion even if you've worked for the city of West Palm Beach for decades. Yeah, it's a couple months salary depending on the length of time you've been here. Mm -hmm. um, it's um, health care up until the uh, end of the year, which is, you know, the end of 2011. Um, the health care piece, I think, is very important because it's hard to take a risk when you have a family and you're worried about your health insurance. Um, so, so we'll see what happens. Uh, we're hoping that people will take advantage of it. Um, it, will, it will help us as mm -hmm. we look to our budget uh, issues. No matter how many people, though, take the buyout, you've talked during the campaign that there will be layoffs. Unfortunately, we're going to have to do that. We're going to have to look at every level of government. We're going to have to look at um, police and fire and how we can maybe do that in a more effective way, provide fire services in a different and more effective way. We're going to have to look at our middle managers. Do we need all the middle managers we currently have? We're going to have to look at the salaries of all of our managers. Um, we're, we're going to have to look at pr possibly privatizing some of our, our um, departments. All of that has to be considered and we'll, we'll do it in conjunction with the, the city commission and in conjunction with, with the um, people who work in the city. So what departments do you think will take the biggest hit? How, how specific can you get before you've even taken office? Yeah. I mean, give people an idea so maybe it softens the blow somewhat. Right. Well, you know, I, I, I can't tell you specifically. Mm -hmm. I can tell you that we have already cut back on many of the departments like code enforcement and uh, certainly our trash pickup. We've made some big changes there so um, we might not may be able to make any more changes there since we've already made some big changes. In our parks and rec department we've made some big changes. Um, but I can't really tell you specifically at this point what will happen. You've talked about pension reform as well. I have. Uh, and it's certainly a big topic um, throughout the state. What are you proposing? What, what's your, your idea of how you can uh, reform the police and fire pensions mm -hmm. and still give them what they want but help the city too? Give us your ideas. Well, we're committed to pension reform. It's something that I campaigned on and it's something that I will continue to pursue. I believe that the police and fire unions also realize that we have to take on pension reform. Um, it's just too much of a nut for us to deal with. If we do nothing over the ne next 10 years, we will be um, needing to spend $44 million more in addition to what we're currently spending over the next 10 years. So we're going to have to look at things like, first of all, we have um, a guaranteed rate of return on our drop-in share accounts of 8.25%. 
to 5%. It's really quite aggressive, and of course, with the market the way it's been, we haven't been able to make that, so the city has to um, uh, make up the difference. We're going to look at lowering that so that um, we can have a more realistic rate of return for that. We have pensionable income right now on the, the police department. Overtime is pensionable income. So the, it's, it happens that people in the police department retire making more money than they made when they were actually working as police officers. So we're going to have to look at that. Mm -hmm. um, we currently have something the way we're set up, we have to go to Tallahassee for any changes that we put in our, um, that we negotiate in our pension system. And uh, we're trying to figure out how we can have what we call home rule so we can make decisions here in West Palm Beach between the unions and um, the city. So we don't have to go to Tallahassee for that. Um, so there's a lot of things that we need to look at. We need to look at, you know, the multipliers. Um, the multipliers is the number that you multiply the number of years you work by. So, for example, if you work 25 years and you have a four multiplier, you get 100% of your salary after 25 years. Mm -hmm. um, uh, one of the, the unions has a three and a half multiplier, the other has a four. We're going to have to look at lowering those. Some would say that, you know, if you put on a bulletproof vest every day and you go out on the, the mean streets and you go into a burning building, that, you know, that would be the thank you after a long career um, of protecting people when you're putting your life on the line. And I absolutely agree. I, I respect um, our police and fire so much and the work that they do. Our fire department is award winning. We have um, been um, awarded many different kinds of um, uh, accolades and it's, we're very proud of that. So I respect the work that they do and I'm not in any way attempting to demean that or suggest to demean that. However, we, we just have to be more realistic about the pensions. And we're not talking about taking pensions away from anybody who currently has a pension. You've talked about uh, setting up business districts to help with economic development. Explain what that vision is. Well, economic development is something I'm really excited about. And I recently had the opportunity to talk with some people from the chamber. And we're so excited about putting a team together to go out and really market West Palm Beach. Um, one of the things we want to do is um, go out and talk to the people who built up around Digital Domain in the other places where mm -hmm. they've been to see if we can bring them to West Palm Beach. And that's going to take a real team approach. The business district area really um, has uh, revolved around a couple of ideas, particularly around Dixie Highway. We have, for example, um, Antique Row on Dixie mm -hmm. Highway. Um, perhaps we need to think about a, a design and home fashion district on Dixie Highway that might revitalize that. So those kinds of things um, to make uh, uh, make us ready to bring in new businesses. And it's something you think you can accomplish quickly and, and try to you know, offset any of the, the major problems that all these businesses are experiencing because of the economy? Yeah, I think it's long term. You know, yeah. obviously we're going to get started right away, but um, my goal is to bring in 10 new businesses to our city. I've already been talking to people um, who are anxious to come, uh, somebody who's ready to move in, bringing his corporate headquarters. Um, so those kinds of things. We want to be welcome. We want, we want people to know we're open for business and um, that West Palm Beach is a great place to, to do business in. A lot of people expected there would be a runoff um, after the March 8th election. How surprised were you that there was not and that you won outright? I was shocked. <laughs> I, um, I totally expected a runoff. I had actually spoken to many people the day before and mm -hmm. said, look, get ready, you know, we're going to have the election, but Wednesday morning we're going to be starting all over again and, you know, I was getting the troops moving again. And uh, so I was so surprised. I'm sure you were also surprised to then learn that 224 registered voters who lived within West Palm Beach's boundaries weren't able to vote in that election. And there is now a subsequent lawsuit because of that. Uh, first of all, your reaction when you heard that and what's been done to make it up to those people and how are we going to prevent this from happening again? Well, I was um, really shocked and, you know, I, I believe that voting is one of the most precious rights that we have and for some people um, not to know that they were supposed to be voting in the West Palm election um, is was very disappointing and upsetting. Um, we, they have 
uh, since been given their voter cards, West Palm Beach voter cards, they are able to vote in the runoff election on March 22nd. So hopefully they will come out and vote then. Um, it was a confusion between the supervisor of elections and the city. Um, typically what happens uh, is that we, or what happened is that we annexed this land into our city. It was vacant land for many, many years. Um, uh, an apartment development was built there and then there was no communication between that development, the city and the supervisor of election to um, let those people know that they're voting in West Palm Beach. Do you think the lawsuit was politically motivated at all? I do. Who I do, do you think was behind it? Well, or is I, behind it? you know, I think that we can speculate who was behind it, but um, you know, I have a five-year-old grandson, and this has really uh, engendered a lot of conversations about uh, what it means to be a good loser and uh, what it means to be gracious in losing. So, let's talk about uh, real quickly before we wrap it up. Uh, your successor, Lois Frankel, has been a huge supporter of yours through the campaign. She's somebody who um, loves being in the public eye, loves being in front of the crowd. The little that I know of you, you seem a, a little more. Um, a little more quiet and shy <laughs> than Lois, who is is, is out there. How, That's how, true. <laughs> yeah, how are how different are you going to be as a mayor? I mean, we're used to Lois Frankel. Yes, you, <laughs> and um, we are very different. I certainly have a different approach. We have some of the very same values and mm -hmm. um, the same uh, love of the city and the same willingness and to do a great job for our city. I'm a little more reserved. Um, and I am a pretty steady person. I've, I've been in professional positions for a really long time. So I think I bring more sort of the corporate um, persona to this. Mm -hmm. uh, you're, are you appointing Lois to any no. positions within the city? <laughs> and there's been talk of that, too. No, no, I'm not. She will be moving on Lois, to other... Lois has yeah. big plans, and I think uh, we'll soon find out what those big plans are. All right, well, um, we look forward to seeing... Um, your big plans come to fruition as you Thank take you. over as the mayor of uh, West Palm Beach. Thank you very much. Thank you Jerry so much. It's been delightful. Thank, Thank you. you. We'll be back with more on To The Point. Our roundtable's coming up with a look at the future of West Palm Beach politics right after this. Joining me now, Brian Crowley, author of the Crowley Political Report, and Andrew Abramson from the Palm Beach Post. Both are here to discuss the future of West Palm Beach politics. And thank you very much, gentlemen, for being with us. Uh, what would you think of uh, Jerry Moyo and what she had to say, Brian? Well, I, you know, she's, uh, she's got a, a big uh, road ahead of her. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are a lot of major issues facing the city right now. Uh, I think the shadow of Lois Frankel will still tend to hover over City Hall a little bit because Lois Frankel's always a big shadow uh, wherever she is. But uh, as Andrew certainly knows, there's a lot of major issues facing the city. All right, and it's, and it's interesting, too, because I think, you know, after eight years of Lois Frankel, I think a lot of people in the city and in the business community are actually looking forward to having someone like Jerry Moyo, who's maybe a little more low-key and maybe a little more interested in listening to what they have to say. So I think there's kind of a sigh of relief. Now, of course, that honeymoon, as you said earlier, that will fade quickly. And there are a lot of issues in the city. There's layoffs coming, as you said before. So, you know, that, that good feeling right now in the city of a new leader, we'll see how long it lasts. Yeah, and, you know, a lot of people are watching closely. I mean, uh, you know, some of the uh, continuing criticism of what's going on in the city is it's ironic that they move into a brand new, glorious, expensive city hall <laughs> because they didn't have room for staff, and now they're laying off staff and sending, giving staff buyouts. So people are now questioning what was that move all about. Mm -hmm. uh, the, you know, the downtown waterfront area that cost $30 million, you know, you still drive by there, and uh, unless there's a boat show, there's no boats. Uh, mm -hmm. Very few people that I see generally on the, on the waterfront there, so people are questioning that expense. Uh, she's going to have to deal with the unions and, and the pension fund right. issues, and there's a lot facing uh, the new mayor. Right, right. And, you know, it's a different time, too. There's no more. There's, there is no more building. They put everything, you know, it was controversial building the city center and the waterfront, but it's there. And now the new mayor, her task is going to be cuts, budget cuts, and it's a completely different mission for her than Lois Frankel had. Well, and that's why I asked her why she really even wanted it. I mean, I think it's a pretty tough job with a, a lot of big challenges. How successful uh, was Lois Frankel dealing with the police and fire unions? Well, I think in the end there, she really, she really stood her ground. In the beginning, I mean, she was supported by the police and fire unions. It's funny. And so was Jerry Moyo when she ran for commissioner. So that's a funny thing. But, you know, in the end, they really came down strong on the unions. And I think, I think Lois got a lot of credit for that from the public, that this is a time when unions maybe aren't very popular. 
and she uh, she stood her ground. It'll be interesting to see if Jerry sticks to that. Mm -hmm. I mean, how different will this city look when you have to go through such drastic measures as far as layoffs and cuts and like you know? I mean, she's gonna. You've really got to go line by line. To see what you can do away with. How different? How different will the city look? Well, I mean, every city is facing mm -hmm. this. The state is facing this. The school districts are facing this. Um, you know, people are going. You know, people don't want their taxes to go up. A lot of people are still hurting. You know, uh, you know, at home themselves with their paychecks being smaller than they were if they have a paycheck at all. But at some point, you start digging into the meat and you start cutting at the, uh, at really needed services. But I, I, but most people, I think, would argue correctly that they're not quite there yet. That there's still some fat in these governments that uh, could be trimmed. She didn't talk too much about the lawsuit mm -hmm. uh, resulting from the uh, the voters who were unable to cast a ballot on mm -hmm. election day, but did say she thought it was politically motivated. Right, and I mean, no matter what, whether it's a city or county, there's a lot of questions there. There was a big screw up. There was 224 residents that for the last 11 years have lived in West Palm and haven't been able to vote in West Palm. Whether they were trying to come out and vote is another question. But you have to quite wonder the lawsuit, whether it came to this point because of political reasons. And you had uh, Paul Ryan's campaign, which originally questioned this. Paul Ryan saying she's not behind the lawsuit, but her supporters were. So no matter what, the city did screw up. And I think a lot of this was, you know, to show, at least to send a message from the Paul Ryan campaign. One of their messages throughout the campaign was that the city does have a lot of problems. And I think this did show, hey, you guys screwed up. What, do you lay that problem on the, at the feet of the city or at the feet of the elections, supervisor of elections? I, I, it's really hard to say. They're both blaming each other, kind of. So it's one of those things we might not know for a while, and we, we really don't know who screwed up there and who was responsible for telling these people that they were actually West Palm residents and had the right to vote in West Palm elections. Right. All right, we're going to tackle merit pay for teachers in just a moment. A merit pay plan that would end tenure for new teachers is on its way to Governor Rick Scott to sign. The Republican-sponsored bill, one of Scott's top priorities, passed the House on Wednesday. Opponents say it chips away at teachers' due process and collective bargaining rights. Former Governor Charlie Chris vetoed a similar bill 11 months ago after widespread protest. Let's state off, right off the top, Brian, that you're on the, the Budget Review Committee for the School District of Palm Beach County. I am. Uh, you know, this is, a, this is a big one, but actually this is not a new issue. No, it's not a new issue. And on Crowley Political Report the other day, we explored the fact that the issue of merit pay for teachers and teacher te testing has been around since 1957 mm -hmm. when Governor Leroy Collins uh, proposed uh, uh, merit pay and, and test teacher testing. And it's, uh, it's uh, been out there for almost every governor since 1957 with uh, former governor and former U.S. Senator Bob Graham actually succeeding. Mm -hmm. uh, in passing a, a merit pay plan and a master teacher plan, as they called it back then. But three years later, the legislature got weak in the knees, and that was the end of that. This time, it looks like it may stick. Yeah, exactly. And what are you hearing? I mean, what, I mean, it's, it's going to be the way it is. So this is what we're going to have to live with. And Well, you know, and the problem with it also, you know, there, there's concern that the legislature is not providing the money necessary mm -hmm. to complete these programs. There's going to be a lot of unfunded mandates in this. The Department of Education, the Florida Department of Education, is going to have to provide a whole new array of tests that teachers are going to have to take mm -hmm. to, uh, to prove that they're eligible for these new pay plans. There's a whole new layer of bureaucracy that's going to be uh, uh, put on top of individual school districts, which is sort of ironic coming from a Republican Party that... Uh, believes that uh, you should get away from centralized government and have it more local. Uh, in this case, there's going to be a lot of direction coming from the top. Well, and we were talking earlier, uh, Andrew, and I mean, times have changed since 1957 when they first proposed <laughs> this idea. I mean, thing, you know, they didn't have the standardized testing they have now and that sort of thing. Right. And you know, what's, what's interesting is that the teachers union is obviously opposed to this, but I've spoken to a lot of teachers. I have some friends and family members that are teachers, and a lot of them, in theory, aren't opposed to the idea, especially a lot of the younger teachers. They think the teachers should be held accountable. Accountable. They think the teachers shouldn't necessarily be able to keep their job and just get raises just because they've been around for a long time. So I think in theory, a lot of them feel that it's a good idea. It's the implementation of the whole thing. They just wonder how the heck is this really going to get done? How is it going to work for schools that, are, you know, one's in a low income area and one's in a high income area? They just think there's too many issues that the legislator hasn't really explained and hasn't really thought about. And that's the main issue there. Yeah, it'll be a big one. We'll be continuing to talk about here on To The Point. We'll be back to wrap it up right after this. 
become tradition that we end with a Crowley closer. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Governor Rick Scott has once again proved he's a little different kind of governor. Uh, last week, the Tallahassee Press Corps had the 56th sometimes annual uh, Press Corps skits. It's been a tradition for the Florida's governor to show up at those skits. Yes. This year, Governor Rick Scott sent a video. Did he? He did. Yeah. And, and uh, quickly, Bob Graham was so excited about the uh, press corps six skits that in his final one he declared himself governor for life and brought the entire FAMU marching 100 onto the stage. That. Oh my gosh, that's great. <laughs> thank you, Andrew Abramson and Brian Crowley, for being with us. And thank mm. you for watching To the Point on this Sunday. Have a great rest of your weekend.